Now, yesterday we talked about pre-processing in MATLAB. Or I've uploaded the function that I set up yesterday called MATLAB RBC nonlinear preprocessing to Elias. There's a prox folder where I, I put the, the file in there. I also put the RBC nonlinear MOD file in there and also the write out function, which I didn't show you what it is, but it is, was just fprintf function in MATLAB that takes input of symbolic variables and prints them into files, just the text. Um, a bit tedious to go through this, but if you, if you find this interesting, have a look. Um, and this is basically what how preprocessing worked. And we saw that we get the exact, almost the exact same files, almost the exact same results up to 10 to the power of minus 50. Okay, so the residual is almost the same. Why? Because Dynair doesn't use MATLAB symbolic toolbox for the um, preprocessing. Uh, the preprocessor and Dynair is it's all open source. You can have a look at that if you can read uh, C++ code. And Dynair actually also uses much more um, ways to simplify derivatives. Okay, so the, the exponential function has a very special derivative and the log function has a very special derivative and you can simplify this. You can even make use of automatic derivatives. So make it make life easier for the computer to compute derivatives. And this is what Dynair does under the hood. Um, but I think for, for us, it is sufficient to more or less have the idea what those files are. So if for some reason we need the file that computes the model equations, we are going to look at the resid file. If we need the dynamic model equations, then we have the dynamic resid file. If we need the static ones, then we have the static resid file. The difference, again, the dynamic is which variables are actually in your model. So all the t minus 1, all the t's, and all the t plus 1 variables. Um, not all of the variables do appear at all periods. And the dynamic files just focus on the ones that do appear. That's, that's the major difference. The static ones is basically like, like we do on paper when we compute steady states. Cancel, um, delete the t minus 1, delete the t, delete the t plus 1 and only focus on the so-called static model. Okay, and this is useful, for instance, for computing the steady state and dyna the dynamic ones, particularly the Jacobians, will be useful for doing simulations. Okay, so when we talk about solution methods and we're gonna have a look at the theory, we will end up at some point, oh, we need the model equations here. Oh, we need the derivative of the model equations with respect to dynamic variables. And we know how to get them, well, it's in the files. So we need to evaluate those files at a certain point. Okay, it can be any point and at certain values for par parameters, whichever you calibrate it to. And some values for the exogenous var variables, usually zero. But we will see that there are some cases where we might consider maybe something else than zero. Okay, so this is. This is um, how we already start thinking about these G models in much more general terms. Okay, so I, I gave you two examples or three examples of these G models, but using this preprocessing, we've already seen we can put model equations into F, a, a model vector. We can put variables into a vector. We can put exogenous variables into a vector, can put the parameters into a vector, can have any size. So we already start to think about how to generalize how to come up with a very general model framework. There might be only there are only t minus one, t and t plus one variables. This is already generalizing these G models to a very general uh, framework. And those codes that we've written, how to compute them to Jacobians, etc., um, they are model independent. Okay, there was the part the first part of the of the script that we we wrote if we have a look again. Of course, you have to declare names. Um, this can be, in a, in a sense, automa automated once you have the names. You could write a for loop in here, so you don't have to do this. Declaration of symbolic variables. And here is some manual work inv involved, of course. You have to 
write down the model equations. Okay, this is for each model different, of course. Everything else after that is model independent. And this is maybe one of the reasons why Dynea became so popular, because in a sense, you only have to write a mode file, declare the names in a more or less user-friendly way, declare the model equations, and then Dynea provides you toolboxes that in principle work for any sort of model. You might run into issues, and we will run into issues, um, of course, because model size is too large or something else. Um, but in principle, that's it. Okay, so the preprocessor of Dynair is, in my opinion, probably one of the reasons why Dynair is very, very popular among researchers, among um, people working at central banks, at the IMF, at the World Bank, uh, etc. Okay, um, compared to yesterday, I've made this a function. Okay, so the, when I call this function, I also create a structure. A structure in MATLAB is just a box where you can throw in stuff and you can access those with a dot, model dot, and then you get all sorts of variables and you can put structures into structures into structures into structures, whatever. Okay, so this is sometimes useful if, you, if you're not sure what the end variables that you want to store, that you want to pass on to other function is, um, you can uh, use structures or if you have many, many things that you want to be collected, then structures are quite useful. Now, so what do I store in, this, in those structures? Just the names, the numbers, and stuff like that. This is similar to our M underscore structure in Dynair. But M underscore in Dynair has much more things because Dynair has much more toolboxes that uh, it needs more information on. So we have this file, and now I want to compute the steady state of my model. So let's, the first thing you would do is, let's first make sure everything is cleared. Okay, CLC is clear the command window. And the first thing I would do is preprocess my model. Okay, and we have written the function for that. Uh, I've uploaded this for you, so if you download this, Let's do this simply, okay? Let's do, do it. This takes a second. And then we created those static G1, static resid, dynamic G1, dynamic resid. Okay, let me delete those, run this again. And we should see that those files hopefully come up. There they are. Now, the next step is calibration. We need to provide numbers for the par parameters. So let's use some numbers. Beta 0 0.99, delta 0 0.025, gamma 1, psi 1.6, rho A 0 0.9. Okay, now I've created them as names in the workspace, okay? So you will see that they, they come up now in my workspace if I run this code. If you look at the residual files, what are the input arguments? I want to evaluate this residual file. So this is a vector that has eight entries, okay? And the names correspond to what I used in my preprocessing under endo name. And the same for params. The input argument is actually just a vector. And I need to make sure that the first entry is beta. The second entry is delta. And I have something that makes sure of this. I have model.endo names. Oh, no, sorry. Param names. OK, so this is the exact ordering that I need to evaluate so the first one is beta, delta, gamma, psi, alpha, rho A. So let me run a for loop to up to the number of parameters. And let's create inside the model structure a, structure, uh, a vector called params. And this is supposed to be 
So I need to basically evaluate the jth parameter name. Okay, so if, if j is equal to one, so if j is equal to one, then model parameter names will be beta. But just a string beta. I already have beta in my workspace and I can tell MATLAB to evaluate the string. And there is an evolve command. And evolve a string will, whatever the string is, just put this into the command line window. And you, we should get the number 0 0.99 here. Okay, so on the right hand side, I now have numbers and I'm putting them into this params and I'm looping over all the parameters. So if I have a look now into these parameters, okay, cool. This is a vector of numbers. Any, this is actually very important. You always need to make sure that you have the correct ordering because in the end you, you get very wrong results and uh, uh, this sometimes happens if you, if you pro in programming that um, for some reason the ordering is changed of model equations or variables, the steady state variables do not correspond to the ones you declared. So um, double check whether this is correct, what this is what you want. Okay, now let's compute steady state numerically. So let's assume we just have one model equation, okay? And we want to, we are looking for this point right here. Um, yeah, for this point right here. So of course, if you know what the function looks like, you would take the derivative, set it equal to zero, check the second derivative, and that's it. Um, for more complicated models, or sometimes you, you cannot, you take the derivative, okay, but then you cannot solve this for x. It's not possible because it's some weird function. Um, so what we usually do is we make use of some algorithm, um, some computer algorithm to find this. And this is what we then call optimization. There are many algorithms um, that are either based on, on, on gradients or on simulations or on some other fancy technique, but they all have the same goal. They want to find this red dot. And one, one of the very first and one of the most use, used ones and um, is, is the so-called Newton-Raphson algorithm, in a, which was more or less invented by, by Newton in an incredibly complicated way that I think no one understands today and then made much more sim or simplified by Raphson. So what the idea here is, is you start somewhere. Okay, so let's say we start here and then we evaluate this function here. And I want to go down. So I, want, I need to have, I want to go get a new x evaluate the function and then compare function values. Am I going in the right direction or not? And I want to go down here because I want to minimize something. So how can we do this? We can have a look at the tangent. So I cannot do the drawing of the line, something like that. Okay, and then we see, bam, here it hits the x-axis again. Let's try out this point. Okay, go back, go back up again and compare whether this difference here it's quite large. So I did a very large step. Also have a look at this difference and then recompute another tangent.
and start again, etc. Okay, and maybe maybe I already got to a point where this tangent, let me be a bit, where this tangent, this is basically a prime of x, right? And a minimum is more or less defined if it is zero, if the slope of this tangent is zero. So check whether the slope is very close to zero. Check whether the function, the change in function is small enough. This is a rather large change, so you, you keep going. Change whether you change something here. You keep going and keep going. So you, you take, another of, um, take another tangent, see where it hits, maybe the x-axis. Try out this one, and then you go back and forth, go back and forth, back and forth, until you end up very close to the red dot. Not exactly, but extremely close. And keep going, keep going. And this newton raphson algorithm, this is the, the very baseline newton raphson algorithm. You can even refine this. Maybe for going from here to there is not a good idea. Maybe this is a too large of a step. So maybe you can also have a look at the second derivative, which gives you some, some idea of the slope and refine your step. But in a sense, all the all optimizer require you to start somewhere, evaluate the function value, and go somewhere else, evaluate that function value, compare. Is there a change, or is this or is the change very, so small that you that we might be in a minimum? Okay, so maybe we are very close to to zero, something like that. Now. In which direction we go, which points we choose, this depends on the algorithm. There are gradient-based ones that, in a sense, make use of the, of the slope of the tangent, or maybe some, they also make use of the curvature here to, take, to provide information on the direction. Maybe they are simply, those new values are simply drawn randomly, say, from a normal distribution. And then you say, with um, the slope might be some information on uh, the standard uh, deviation of the normal distribution. Maybe you simply try out many, many points. Okay, and then for each point, you sort of try to come up with a direction, get another 10,000 points and another and another, etc. There are many algorithms. This is the whole topic in numerical optimization of numerical optimization. Um, the, this is uh, for math uh, students, I guess, um, very interesting. For us, or for me at least, this is important that you have a sort of idea what an optimizer tries to do. It tries out different values. It provides a direction for new values in some way. We would need to have a look at the exact algorithm. And at some point, it stops. So we need some criteria Maybe the algorithm ran for a million function ev evaluations. Maybe that's enough. Maybe I stop there. Or the, it is so close to the, the, the zero here um, that it stops. And we need to tell the algorithm what is close to zero. We won't never exactly hit zero, but maybe 10 to the power of 5 or 4 or 7 is fine for us. And we are looking at to compute uh, steady states of consumption of output, right? Um, I don't really care about the, the, the fifth or the sixth uh, point, uh, the sixth digit after, after the decimal. So maybe I'm fine with some tolerance level of 10 to the power of minus five, minus six, minus seven, maybe even minus four. Okay, it all depends what you, you want to achieve. Now, this is just one variable. Okay, our problem um, we have a vector valued function. We have n model equations, and we want this to be zero. Okay, so we want to minimize f on x, we want to find the x, so we actually want to 
find the x, the argument x, where this is equal to zero. And this is a vector valued function. And there are some algorithms that can do this. Most algorithms actually want as a function value just a number. They don't like a vector valued function. Okay, so some algorithms can deal with vector valued functions. Most though require f of x to be a scalar, a number, just a number. And then they want to try to find the x for which this number is so close to zero that I'm fine. I can always redefine any problem I have into trying to find the zero. Put everything on one on the left hand side of the equation, so you have a zero on the right hand side. Um, if you want to maximize utility, for instance, if you know your problem is actually a utility function, simply um, put a minus in front of your function, and then you're minimizing, maximizing utility, utility times minus one, you're actually minimizing the negative utility. Okay, so in numerical optimization, by convention, we're always talking about minimization. Even though in economics, we're always talking, or more or less, most of the times we're talking about maximization, simply put in minus one in front of your function, and then it becomes a minimization problem. So how can we do this? Well, remember from your undergraduate stu studies, you had something similar. You have data on y and on x, and you try to find to solve a function, a regression function, if you remember that, right? And then you had a look at the residuals and you, have, you take the sum of squared residuals. So one way to do this, okay, so one way is to minimize, call this g of x equals the uh, I squared, sum of squared residuals. And that is a scalar value, a scalar. Okay? So we could either, as our objective function, have the vector valued function or some other objective function. This is the sum of squares. Uh, you could also, of course, have a look at the mean absolute deviation or I don't know, whatever, some other loss function that you have in, in mind. This is whatever works best. At the end, we want this function, find the x, the steady state of my model, for which all model equations are exactly zero. This is the goal, or close to zero, okay? And either I can run an algorithm on all the functions at once, that would be good, or maybe I need to come up a way to use different algorithms. So maybe let's have a look at the squared residuals. Okay, so this is the problem that we are faced with. Now let's have a look how we can do this with, um, with MATLAB. So the first step is we need to start somewhere. So let's create a vector where to start, the x zero, or let's call this steady state zero. Um, and again, let's have a look, not that I'm doing something wrong, at our names, very important. This is, needs to be a vector now, and I need to have those names in this ordering. So let me copy this over here. Okay. So Y, C, K, L, A, R, W, I, V. So I need a steady state. For y, um, I could draw this randomly. I could even do some, simply draw it randomly, try to find, if you have no clue, then that, that might be a good idea. 
Um, if you have somehow already have a clue how RBC models and Keynesian models work, because we know how to compute this in closed form, we know the values more or less, but you have slightly more complicated models, simply reuse old values. They should, they're probably close to the new ones, right? And numerical algorithms um, are designed to, to work in a sense, but initial values do play an important role. But let's do, let's provide um, some values. Let me copy and paste this. Okay, so this is then the second entry, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, and the eighth. And so why 1.2 consumption, maybe something like 0 0.9 investment would then be the difference between that. Let's, that would work in the, in the aggregate demand equation, but let's put a 3.5 in here, why not? Now capital, maybe 10 in steady state, labor, 0 0.3, a third was something that I sort of target. Technology, oh, that was the log process. I actually know it analytically, so let's introduce the one here. Um, interest rate, maybe something like 0 0.03, 3%, something like that. 2.2 for the wages, I don't know. Okay, the more experience you have with models, you sort of have a feeling where the steady state will be. So this is my X zero or my steady state zero. Next, I need to tell, I want to run an optimizer. Okay, and we will talk about many different optimizers and we will compare them uh, today. And for this, I have to, to um, define a function. Now let's, so let's call this function and tell the optimizer with this fancy add symbol, the variable that it should um, um, change, or should try out different values. And after that, I need to tell MATLAB which function to evaluate. Now, which function do I want to, to minimize? This is the RBC static residual. So I'm copy and pasting this name here. Put this right here. And now I need to have a close look into the input arguments. The steady state, I want to find the steady state. I want to try out many different um, axes. So this is actually where my optimizer should Try out X, try out X, try out X, try out X, try out X. The exogenous variables, ah, those should be actually always zero. So exogenous variables, there's only one, one. This is X, A. Okay, so nothing to change here, but I pass additional input arguments using this fancy add technique. So I'm creating what is in MATLAB called a function handle. It knows that it's supposed to evaluate RBC static residual. And here I'm telling you, uh, I'm telling um, that to, to loop over, to run over which variable is X param. And params, those are my model params. So I need to do model params. Okay, nothing happens if you run this code yet. And if you have a look at fun, it is a function handle with a value. So what does now an optimizer do? An optimizer will take some value for X param, for instance, our initial value, put it in, this is given, this is given, and let's evaluate this function. Um, oh, I need to provide the info here. So let's evaluate this function and it will output the residuals. This is not close to zero, no? Okay, then the optimizer will try a different steady state. I don't know, maybe 1.01. 1. 
also not close to zero. So this is where numerical optimization helps. How do I change these x param zero? How, to, how do I give new directions to the x? How much uh, to actually come close to the minimum here? I want this to be exactly zero for all the um, rows. Okay, so this is basically evaluating this at the initial step value. This is what all optimizers do, and you need to have, um, this needs to, to work. Otherwise, optimizers will complain and tell you, nah, this doesn't work. So let's have a look now at F solve. That's it, to the help. Solve system of nonlinear equations. Solves is a nonlinear system solver. Solves a problem specified by f of x equals to zero, where f of x is a function that returns a vector value. This is exactly what I have. X is a vector or a matrix. And how do I call this? Um, function name initial value and options for the optimizer. And this will give me an X. And if I also want to have the function value, the option, the best function value and the best X, I can even have additional output arguments. So this is how I call that. There are some examples if you want to have a look how this works for different um, stuff. At the end, there's always now, those are all the options that we can change for the optimizer for us, which is very, which will be very important. Uh, there are different algorithms, okay. Um, the function tolerance, okay. This is very important for us. The default is set to 10 to the power of minus six. Okay, so if it tries out different values and if the function doesn't change in this, with this tolerance level, then it thinks it, find, it found the minimum. And the same also for the, there's also something for, for X, the same, yeah. And at the end, for people that are much more into math, the exact algorithms used is explained in two sentences, of course. So then you can have a look at Wikipedia and see what's, what's happening under the hood. So F solve very easily. Um, you need to provide the function, provide an initial guess and some options. And MATLAB has a certain special command for all the built-in optimizers that create a structure with options. And this is called optim set. And optim set, you simply plug in then options that you want to change from the default. So the default of to tolerance function was one e minus six. Maybe I want to, this to be even tighter, one e minus seven. Okay, so let's um, do, for instance, tall function, I want this to be, so I, I put in the name of the option and whatever new value I want to have, maybe I want to have one uh, 10 to the power of minus seven. And also for tall X, I want maybe the same tolerance level, which is very tight, which is very, for, for a steady state, this is maybe too, too tight, but who cares? And this outputs me, um, steady state, let's call this steady state numerical optimizer one and my residuals and one. Okay, let's run this. Ha. Done. Maybe let's include one more option here. Let's do display um, iter for iteration. So let's see how many iterations it took. And we have a bit of more output here. Four iterations, 
that's it. Okay, for iteration, it's computed 45 times the function and the change, or the, no, sorry, the actual function value, it started out with 0 0.05, but then it ended up very close to zero. And there's some information on how optimal the step is, et cetera, uh, and dependent on the algorithm. Now, if I have a look at the steady state, this is then the steady state. Okay. This is F solve. There's also another optimizer, LSQN on Lin. Is it? Yeah. Which solves nonlinear least squares problems. Ha. Huh. Definition solves a blah, blah, blah. F1 squared, F2 squared, Fn squared. This is basically what I've just written. This is a solver specially designed to solve vector value function by minimizing the sum of squared residuals. Cool. Exactly what I need. What is the call? Function, starting value. Ooh, I can even include lower bounds and upper bounds. This might be sometimes very useful. Okay, the other solver that I just did, it was unconstrained. It tried out all, could even go negative consumption, negative output, which doesn't make sense. So having lower bounds and upper bounds might be quite interesting. And then options, and use optim options to set these options. Same call. And then for the output argument, the residual norm and the residuals. The residual is actually what I want, and the residual norm is the square. So that's also, basically, I can simply copy and paste the input arguments, but there were all now lower bounds and upper bounds that I can include. Um, so let's go back up here. Lower bound for Y should always be zero. Upper bound for y, I don't have one, so I could put in infinity or maybe a hundred, whatever, whatever you think is useful. Okay, for consumption, that's the same. It shouldn't be negative. Okay, so it shouldn't be negative, capital, Okay, the same labor, well, actually labor. I have a feeling this should be rather between zero and one. Um, technology, I, have, I know that this technology is already exactly one, but let's leave it to this. Okay, let's provide lower bounds, upper bounds. Maybe try to have a bit of difference here, I don't know. Okay, now let's run this code. Oh, that was fsolve. And let's now include steady state. This is then the second that I have. Then um, the sum of squared is what provide, gives me LSQN and the residuals is also given by LSQN as an output argument. Okay. Let's run this. Oh. Length of upper bounds is something is wrong with my bounds. Oh, sure. I didn't change the numbers here. So this should be two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And let's rerun this. Cool. No errors. It also was very quick. It gives me some information on the actual function value and tells me that a local minimum is possible. 
And here we already, maybe you already see, there might be something like a global minimum and a local minimum. This optimizer here is gradient-based. Gradient-based optimizers are usually very fast. They converge quite fast towards local minima. So if you, if you have a function so like, like we had here, like we had here, and my initial value would be here, Typically, what we have is a gradient-based optimizer to find this point. If we're lucky, for some reason, they, they move right here, and then they will tend towards this. OK? This is the pro of gradient-based optimizers. They're fast. They converge very quickly, which is good. But initial values really matter. So typically, what you would do is try out different initial values, maybe randomize them, okay? Rerun the optimal, it was so quick, it didn't take a second to, so maybe randomize initial values 100, run a for loop, and then simply compare what is the best, what is the lowest function value. And that is then what you, what you choose. Okay, so this is LSQN on Lin, which in a sense, Inherent in the algorithm, it minimizes the sum of squared residuals. Now, there are also different um, algorithms that work on, let's have a look at fmin search. Find minimum of unconstrained multivariable function using a derivative free method, non gradient based method. Okay, so this minimizes a function, searches for the minimum, but f of x is a function that returns a scalar. Okay, so here we need to provide a different function to this. The call is the same. Function, initial value, options, use optin set to set options. And output argument, x, function value, exit flag. Exit flag is whether or not it uh, found. So for fmin search, um, I cannot use this function here because this is vector valued. So I need another function. Let's call this function sum of squared, which sums the residuals and takes dot the square. Okay, new function handle. And let's minimize. Um, so this is number three, sum of squares is the function value that I'm getting. F min search, I need to input the function that it's minimizing, initial value, and my options. Copy and pasting. Let's see. Now, huh, took much longer. I don't know the exact algorithm. I would need to look in the, in the, uh, the simplex algorithm, okay? Um, and the function value here gets lower, 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 lower. But I wanted to have it below one point, uh, 10 to the power of minus seven. Okay, here it is, minus seven, but it is not lower yet. Or something, yes, it is lower, but this is not the actual function value. Um, but it didn't, it didn't stop yet. So I, need to, I would need to have a look at how exactly it is determined, but it tells me something. Maximum number of function eva evaluations has been exceeded. So it did not tell me I found a minimum. This is not good. Okay, so in a sense, I need to, it tells me, please increase max fun evolves. So I am changing the options here. Max fun evolves, let's do a thousand, 10,000. Let's see how this works. Ha, optimization terminated. I want this to have. The current X satisfies the termination criteria using that. And the function value also satisfies the criteria. 
So I guess the function was fulfilled, but the x, the x, x was not yet fulfilled. Okay. This is fmin search. Let's maybe do another one. If you have MATLAB global optimization toolbox installed, you also have something like pattern search. Find minimum of a function using pattern search. I have no idea what it is. Okay, um, but it will tell me then basically. Uh, or, oh, well, it finds a local minimum. Pretty good to the function. Okay, and what is the call? I can call it with initial values and also even linear inequalities. I don't have them. And linear equalities, no, no, no. Oh, lower and upper bounds, okay. And if I don't have linear equalities, then I simply set the input argument to empty matrices. I can also use inf for lower bounds and, and upper bounds to use unconstrained optimization. And I can even have nonlinear inequalities. Okay, very fancy. And then options, use optimal options. Hmm. Okay, let's try out this one. So let me copy and paste my last command. Steady state and four and four. Pattern search. It needed a function a steady state at uh, the initial value. Then there were four things that I need to include empty matrices. I can then include lower bounds and upper bounds and nonlinear. I don't have nonlinear constraints. Let's see whether this works. Yeah. Optimization terminated. Mesh size is less than mesh mesh tolerance. I have no idea if that is a good or a bad thing. I would need to look into the help, etc. There are many, many, many optimizers. Um, and we can now basically com compare them. So for instance, we can have a look at the steady states. Okay, so let's have a look at the steady state one, steady state two, steady state three, steady state four. They all look very close to each other, right? But ah, no, there are, there are quite some difference here. You can also use like format long, and then you get many more points after the decimal. Okay, so these look more or less close to each other, but something is off with the last with the pattern search. This does not look, look pretty good. We can also have a look at the residuals. So instead of looking at steady states, um, let's have a look at the residuals. Oh, I don't have resid n3. Oh yeah, of course, I don't have resid n3 because the last two didn't compute the residuals, they computed the sum of squared residuals. So I would actually need to compute the residuals myself. I have the RBC static, so this is then resid N3, and including the stuff here. Okay, and for N4 as well here. And for the first one, I don't have the sum of squares. So let's compute the sum of squares, resid and one dot square. So I have now everything. Free run. Okay. And now let's have a look at the residuals. Resid, yes, resid and one, resid and two, resid and three, resid and four. Okay, something's really off with the last one. Okay, if I don't, 
include this one. I have at least, this looks really good because this is very close to zero. This is also very good. Ah, the second one, hmm. I mean, for me, this would be okay. Um, if we had a look at the actual um, steady states, they're very, very close to each other. But seems like in our problem, the first and the third one were the closest. Let's have a look at the sum of squared residuals. This should be, this should confirm my, yeah. So this is really close to zero. This is still 10 to the power of minus 10, which is quite okay. And this is also really, really close to zero. Okay. So this is how you would compute the steady state numerically, okay? And I've, um, I will post uh, a, this, this script that I've just written um, after class as well with a bit more information. Um, let's have a look here. Now, this is what we've already done. Lower bounds, upper bounds. I think the initial values are a bit different. Now I have a function, I have the squared function, I have F solve, I have LSQN on Lin, and I have even more optimizers. F min unc, which is unconstrained optimization. F min search, we saw that one. This is constrained optimization, so I can use lower bounds, upper bounds. Simula simulated annealing, which is based on some sort of temperature stuff. Uh, and pattern search. And also I include the analytical steady state, what we did on paper. Okay, and I've stored it into analytical. Compute the residuals of the analytical one. Let's quickly do this. So you see that the computer is just a computer. You would expect that this is exactly, all is exactly zero because this is analytical, right? This is closed form. Unfortunately, it's not. So for the second variable and the second to last variable, it's very close to zero, but it's not zero. Um, what, are the, what are those variables? So for consumption and wages. So in some sense, my model equations do include some, I don't know, some log function or some squared function or some function where there is some numerical in the um, inaccuracy. But honestly, 10 to the power of minus 15 is wow. Okay, so if, if a numerical optimizer hits 10 to the power of minus 15, this is perfect. Okay, if it even hits 10 to the power of minus seven, six, this is also fine for steady state. For different things, your tolerance might be different. What about the sum of squares residuals? Notice that this is only for two variables. So the sum of squared residuals will be very low. Okay, so this is really 10 to the power of 31. Okay, here you can see that this is the analytical correct steady state. And then I'm also running Dynair. Dynair stores the steady state in the OO underscore structure. I'm evaluating, computing the residuals from Dynair and the squared residuals. And at the end, I put everything into two tables. Let's run this first. Ah, very importantly, since I'm running Dynair in a script file right here, my computer doesn't know what Dynair is. It's, what is Dynair? Dynair is something that I need to tell MATLAB where it is. Okay, so this is this question comes up all the time. So if you start your MATLAB session, you need to run this add path command once, only once. That's it. And this is for a Mac, uh, for Windows, this would be C, um, um, colon, slash, uh, still the slash even on Windows, um, Dynair version, and only the MATLAB folder. Okay, so now I know I have Dynair. Okay, now I can run everything. No, this is actually 
analytical, analytical comes first, Dynair comes second. So we have to compare steady states first. Now this is what analytical, my analytical steady state gave me. This is what Dynair's numerical optimizer computed. Um, I don't know what the default optimizer we use is. Probably some sort of block optimizer and or simplex optimizer, I don't know. Um, but for instance, in Dynair, you can change in your steady state command. Um, you could uh, change an option, solve algo, and then a number, and it will change the optimizer used to compute the steady state. But you see that they are almost equal to each other, right? Now here we see some difference. Here's what this looks very close to each other. Okay, and here this is also fine. Looks good. Ah, here something is off. This looks more or less like my initial value. So it's something's wrong here. And pattern search also didn't work here. Now those two are global optimizer. And um, here they were not successful, definitely not. But in more complicated models, actually those two are very powerful. If you really have a very hard time or if you're dealing with, um, with problems that where the functions are not so smooth and you have kinks in your functions and stuff like that, those uh, optimizers based on simulations are actually outperform other things. For estimation, for instance, if you want to maximize likelihood functions, stuff like that, this may, does make sense. But it depends. And it also depends, quite honestly, you, can, you should try this maybe at home. Try to put in an initial value that is far away from the actual steady state. Because these steady state, these initial values, if you have a look, are very close to the steady state. Of course, the gradient based optimizes like that. They are fast, they find the local minimum. Now, if you put them, if you put those values, randomize them far away, the picture will look differently. Now, what about um, the residuals? Let's run that. So for the first equation, oh yeah, the, so there was something off in the second and then the last equation, but something off, which is very close to zero. Numerically, the overall sum of squared residuals is numerically zero. Now, Dynair, okay. Dynair's default tolerance levels for steady states are actually 10 to the power of minus five for tall fun and tall x both. Um, we were a bit stricter, so our results with the best optimizers were actually quite good. Okay, so this looks good, this looks good, this looks good. F min search was probably the best, or F solve was the best in terms of some of squared residuals. And yeah, simulated annealing. Oh. Pattern search wasn't bad, but if you have actually look at the the overall equations here, so something was more difficult with the first equation and the last two equations. Okay, now so much, so much for computing steady states. So this is really what Dynair does when you have a mode file. Um, where is my mode file? There it is. Set up model equations and provide initial values. This is the steady state zero and run the steady command. Okay, this is what Dynair does. It evaluates, it minimizes the static reset file. That's it. And if you use a steady state model block, then it's different. Then Dynair creates a file called steady state where it's a MATLAB script that evaluates the steady state numerically. Um, analytically. That's it. Okay, it doesn't run optim optimization. 
Okay, good. Now I hope, uh, so today's session was about steady state computations in MATLAB, not in Dynair. So you hopefully understood how this works and also that there are many different algorithms. And it is, in my opinion, very often uh, useful to try out different optimizers. In Dynair, you can do so um, by changing solve algo, okay? And putting a number in here. The default is four. Let's run Dynair RBC nonlinear. Okay, which is, seems like it's not doing anything, but it is optimizing. There is a zero, there is a one, it looks all very fast, but if you have a look at the numbers, they don't really change because it's, my initial values are really close, etc. And if you have a look at the manual of Dynair, Dynair reference manual, um, finding the steady state with Dynair nonlinear solvers, you can change the maximum number of um, iterations. You can change the tolerance function. By default, this is set to, oh, no, to set this to, what is this? Okay, so this is on my machine. EPS is machine precision. Okay, so this might be a different number on your machine. It depends on the computer you have. This is a special variable for machine precision. Um, and then you can change solve algo. So use F solve. Oh, we, we saw that. Then use Dynair's own Newton like algorithm with line search. Split the model into blocks and do something. Use Christopher Sim solver, um, whatever that is. Um, trust region algorithm oh, with auto scaling. Now, this is the default. Um, then Newton algorithm with sparse Gaussian elimination with a sparse L. LU um, solver requires bytecode and block option. So there's much more happening. But in a sense, if you are faced with a model where it is very hard for you to compute the steady state, simply try out different algorithms and then have a look at what the algorithms give you and maybe try out then different initial values. Reuse those. Okay, so those are the, the typical steps that we use. Um, Oh yeah, and then there's a whole, whole other detail. Okay, okay, all right. 